everybody. I uh, just wanted to give you a brief rundown on uh, the multicast API from within Java. Uh, this is from chapter 29 of the Java for Programmers book. Uh, first, uh, what's multicasting? Um, well, we're, pre we're familiar with sockets at this point. We know how to open up a uh, connection to a specific IP address with a specific port and make a uh, unicast uh, transmission occur between a, a connection that um, consists of a client and a server. But we'd like to know what is a multicast socket and the answer there is it's connectionless. We're using UDP IP instead of TCP IP. So a unicast socket provides a point-to-point -point connection. Um, it gives us a pipe with data that comes in at the same at the same order in the same order that it went uh, that it, that it goes out in. So what we'd like to know is um, what other options are there and multicast gives us uh, the ability to broadcast out onto a local area network and then traverse the routers and uh, we have a special uh, tag for that called time to live which allows us to um, determine how many hops a router will um, allow us to make before uh, we're killed so we don't flood the internet with our packets. So a packet could go perhaps as many as three hops through compatible routers in order to be able to reach uh, all of the local area network uh, computers within a certain range of our um, of our LAN. So why uh, doesn't everyone use multicast? And the answer is well not all routers pass multicast sockets. You've got to configure it. A multicast might not be supported on your network especially if you're in um, an environment that's got administered smart switches. Uh, the time to live uh, packet parameter allows you to determine the maximum number of routers a packet can traverse. So um, what do you need it for? And the answer is well uh, you can use it for uh, broadcast if you want to do plug-and-play uh, devices such as printers. So it's very good for discovery. Uh, it's good for broadcast. Um, it's good for um, uh, things that allow um, network legs to um, permit, if you will, the uh, multicast traffic. Um, an ether switch typically will pass all the multicast traffic through. Ether switches typically only isolate unicast traffic, and um, you can get Ethernet to run at a variety of um, relatively high speeds um, and so as a result we can now do video on the Ethernet and in fact a number of commercial enterprises are now doing that. So um, broadcast video uncompressed well when we look at something like video we see CCIR 601 a standard video which is um, standard definition and it's um, quite a large uh, stream now 160 megabits per second uncompressed um, so it seems to me like um, some kind of compression is going to be needed even with today's standard uh, very high speed rates um, so when we think about what video is we know that it includes both image sequences and audio um, it includes uh, screen captures, which are generally over noise, uh, almost noise free, but it also includes things like uh, camera in, uh, frames, which come in with tons of noise. But if we have a screen cap capture, well, what we have is the ability to exploit what's known as uh, inter frame coherence as well as intra frame coherence. That is, the pixels within the frame are very similar to the pixels that are next to them. So, for example, here we see large areas of white with a few areas of black. And so we can code this relatively efficiently during the transmission. So typically when we look at the uh, socket API uh, we see sockets and server sockets but when we look at multicast we have a separate socket known as the multicast socket. And what that does is it receives and transmits uh, multicast socket datagrams and the datagrams are connectionless. So that means we can um, simply uh, push them out to our network uh, without regard for whether or not they're being received. So in a connectionless protocol it's roughly analogous to dropping letters in a mailbox. We don't know if anybody got them. 
and there's no acknowledgement unless we decide to program it into the uh, application layer. So um, when we think about um, how we are going to go about doing this, we look at, for example, this connection.java, which allows us to um, make a uh, socket, start the uh, socket thread, uh, proceed to run and print out something like uh, the date. That's typical. Um, and when we look at a daytime server, uh, we can see that there are these sockets which allow us to uh, get the local host and listen for the uh, date and time coming in. So our, our UDP, that's User Datagram Protocol, based applications don't use this socket technique. They don't make specific connections. Instead, they rely on a, un, well, we'll call it a connectionless protocol, which is typically unreliable. Uh, it has some advantages. It requires that um, uh, we be tolerant to the fact that we may or may not have reliable communications, but it also uh, allows us to go very quickly. Uh, we don't have to stop and wait for acknowledgments, um, and we can have a message-oriented service. The datagrams for um, containing our data uh, typically are small. Once they get too large, things will not work properly. And um, uh, the question of how you're going to pack the data and make it useful in a small packet uh, is really application specific. Uh, your datagram packet is uh, an array of bytes and something that is listening for the datagram packet has to know how to decode the bytes, which means it has to know what to expect when the bytes come in. Uh, the datagram socket um, is a uh, class that is representing a mechanism for sending and receiving datagram packets. Um, address information for outgoing packets is contained in the header. Uh, a socket is used to read the incoming packets. They must be bound to an address. Sockets that are used for sending must be bound as well, but in most cases that's done automatically. There is no special datagram server socket class. Since packets can be lost, the ability to set timeouts is important. So um, if packets come in very late, we may just discard them. So here comes the datagram uh, socket API, and uh, it gives us a port and an internet address. Um, and uh, typically what we're going to do is um, provide some sort of an example so you can see all of this stuff working. And what I've done here is uh, I've set up a, um, a small chat facility which allows us to communicate. I'm just doing this on the local host now. Let's see if this works. Testing the local host. And so we can see that was transmitted and received over here, testing the local host. Hello, CR320. And there it is, receiving a message. Now that'll work just as well on non-local hosts, but for the purpose of um, this broadcast, I think it's um, just a little bit easier to do this from local host to local host, and certainly that's the way you would do it if you were at home, unless you had two computers. So then the question becomes, okay, how does all this work? Um, what I have created is a small toolkit called the Multicast Utility, and uh, what it does is it selects a port that you can use for transmitting your datagram packets. Um, and uh, it sets up a, um, an address known as a multicast address associated with those packets. So multicast addresses have been uh, reserved. And here is an example of a uh, multicast address. And I put that into the uh, utils under um, net.multicast. Uh, so if we go back to the um, uh, the main, we can see there's a, a mechanism that asks if you want to transmit or receive. Uh, we have a, um, uh, a chat main and a transmitter for chat. Uh, and in the uh, chat main, we have a streaming audio multicast receiver, so we can do audio as well, which is kind of neat. And um, we can also find a way to do video if we like but we're constrained a little bit by the size of our um, uh, 
of, of the datagram packets that we can use. So let's get back to this chat main. Uh, here we are in uh, port 1234, just made up a port for the multicast uh, utility. Uh, we've created a jinfo frame, which is going to give us the ability to uh, type something uh, into the API. And then uh, what we do in here is um, we enable a loopback so we can see what we've, we've typed ourselves to ourselves. Um, and then um, we're going to process with our multicast socket. Here what we'll do is we'll create a chat receiver. And the chat receiver has got a little uh, run text field in it. And whenever somebody hits enter, it takes um, the text information and then sends a line out to the, um, uh, the multicast stream. And uh, if we call open, it'll send a file. If we say open sir, it'll send a serialized file or an instance. Otherwise, it just takes the string that comes in and it calls mcx.sendbytes. So send a serialized instance of a file. Uh, what we're going to do is we're going to get the file as bytes and then send the bytes. That way we can send objects which are not just uh, text. If we want to send a text file, we can get the read file in and call send a file, which is going to take the entire file in as a string and then send it out as bytes. So everything seems to depend on the MCX instance known as multicast util. And so what we'd like to know is how to send and receive bytes. So here's how we set the loop back. We just set loop back disabled or enabled. Uh, here we can get bytes from the datagram packets. We call uh, new datagram receive. Um, we do call a multicast uh, socket receive on the on the datagram. Uh, we get the data and then we can do something to get the data into a byte array and return it. We don't know exactly how big it'll be so we use uh, b.length and that's important because um, rcv.getLength will come back with a datagram packet that is a length that we're not sure about until we receive it. When we want to send data, we do know the length of the data that we're going to be sending in advance uh, because we're given it as a single array of byte. And uh, so what we're going to do is create a datagram packet from that array. And then we're going to call um, uh, multicast socket.send on the datagram packet. When you look at something like multicast socket.send, uh, what you're seeing is a part of the, um, uh, the Java API, the datagram socket. So that now we're really deep into the, um, the API for sending uh, data. So our job as programmers is to pack datagrams and then send them. Uh, that's, um, that's the end of it. Once they uh, are received, um, someone will invoke get bytes. The datagram will come in and the bytes will come out. And that's the long and short of how to use multicast. So when we go and run something like this, the loopback enables us to um, see what it is we're uh, typing. And if we uh, run it twice, this is the second in instance. And it's seen by the other um, transmitter slash receiver. If we run it three times, all three um, clients are able to be activated. And they, all three of these things can see uh, what's going on. And if we type open, it tries to open a file for transmission. I don't happen to have one available, although, um, well, here's a CSV file. I suppose we could try and send that. And, um, oh, there it comes. There's the CSV file. So here's a whole bunch of uh, names and addresses and phone numbers that were stored in the CSV file. And presumably they're here, and now they're here as well. So they all got transmitted to all three um, uh, info frames which is kind of neat. Anyway, that's my little demo. Hope you liked it. Thanks a bunch. Bye-bye.